to start with uh, a little story uh, of my own life, actually. This was back in 1983 when uh, I had absolutely no idea what NMR was. I completed my MSc and I joined the group of Professor Atar Rahman. Uh, at that time, to be very precise, was September 13, 1983. And in that particular group, there used to be many very, se uh, very senior, very strong students at that time. Uh, these very nasty seniors used to ask the junior to present lectures. Whenever Professor Atarman wanted to start a lecture series, they always wanted to start from the most junior one. Because by the time the junior finished, Professor Atarman was either in the UK or forget what was actually happening. And I was the most junior one at that time. A strong big man uh, caught me in the middle of corridor and he said, who are you? I said, my name is Iqbal, and I recently joined Professor Talman's group. He said, okay, you have to present a lecture next week. <laughs> we are starting a lecture series. And he gave me uh, a topic which, uh, with the handwriting of Professor Talman, and fortunately I have all these notes with me. And the topic says that uh, you have to present a lecture on inadequate incredible natural uh, incredible natural abundance double quantum transfer experiment. It was even so difficult for me to pronounce at that time. You see, there was a time when inadequate was developing. And I remember reading an article of Gunther uh, about uh, this technique. Very, uh, very primitive, almost embryonic state of the development of inadequate. And here I was, after one week, presenting a lecture on inadequate uh, in front of Professor Tarakman uh, and in front of so many other people. I don't know how that lecture went, but I remember Professor Tarakman calling me in his office and said, you want to write a book with me? <laughs> and that was the biggest surprise of my life. Actually. After one week of joining Professor Tarakman, I was hired to write a book as a co-author with Professor Tarakman. I think this was because of NMR spectroscopy. Uh, a little understanding which I was able to develop because of the forceful interaction of a senior. And therefore, sometimes uh, the interventions of seniors are very important. Junior must remember it. Uh, this all started from there. And I still remember we used to have a small 60 megahertz bedding machine at that time. And in 1983, we acquired the first 100 mega, megahertz broker machine, 90 megahertz broker machine. So, uh, in front of uh, people who are actually working in the frontiers of animal spectroscopy, my tale would largely be uh, the tale of a person who is using animal as a tool in the field of natural product industry. But realizing that you would have a uh, lot of very young people who are equally excited about animal, I thought I should really talk about some of the basics. Although this is an entire course which I would, uh, inshallah, deliver very soon perhaps uh, a course of some two weeks or three weeks. But some of these slides would actually tell you the best basics of animal spectroscopy. A lot has already been covered yesterday when Ellen and Dr. Asmel talk about uh, the developments both in terms of uh, hardware, in terms of software, in terms of basic uh, philosophy of inverse spectroscopy or pulse gradient field spectroscopy. I would not really go into that actually. I would rather st start from the basics and give you a little bit story of NMR, how it actually developed. Uh, I will start from a very important saying, uh, a quotation from James Belvin from Dyson Bennett Laboratory, Oxford. He said, uh, NMR spectroscopy is perhaps the greatest, most important uh, development which has the strongest impact on chemical research after the development of accurate balance. And it is uh, so true actually, because I feel NMR is one discipline which has changed the whole scenario of the field.
field of chemical sciences, biochemical sciences, and so many other sciences. So that actually reflects the importance of animal spectroscopy. And as we all understand what a spectroscopy is, animal is not different from other spectroscopy. It is a basic interaction of molecular architect, molecular structure with absorption of light, interaction with the light, absorption, emission, and scattering of light. So interaction between molecule and light and the resulting emission, absorption, scattering, and measurement, accurate measurement of these three phenomena would tell you a lot indirectly about the structure. And therefore, NMR is not different from the basic trivial UV spectroscopy, IR spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, in a whole range of different spectroscopy technique, NMR is not very different. The reason why I want you to present this slide is because NMR generally scare people. The basic fact is, the people think NMR is different from uh, others. NMR is not different. NMR is very simple, at least at the conceptual level. And this is what I would like to present here also. This is our electromagnetic radiation. And there are a variety of different types of electromagnetic radiation depending on their frequency and energy. And each has a capacity to do something with the molecule. It could be uh, X-rays or uh, cosmic rays, which can break the architect of the molecule. Or it can be very benign gamma rays, uh, 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 radio waves, and microwaves. It doesn't really harm your molecule, but carry out certain changes. For instance, in case of LMR, it's uh, basically the nuclear spin which is affected. In case of uh, UV, you're talking about electronic transitions. In case of IR, you're talking about stretchings of bondings and whole range of different bonding changes, bond lines, bond angles. So uh, the electromagnetic radiation, depending on their energy, can cause different types of interaction in the molecule. NMR is the most, most friendly one because it doesn't really harm your molecule at all. It just changes the nuclear spin, the orientation of nuclear spin. And uh, without going into details of, uh, of a variety of different types of spectroscopy technique, ultraviolet, as you know, uh, effect at the electronic level, infrared is a vibration rotation level, and a variety of different types of information which you get. NMR, uh, when nuclei are placed under the static magnetic field, their spins are changed. And this gives you information about the electronic environment of the nuclei, their numbers and numbers of neighboring atoms. See, uh, yesterday Alan was talking about the content of information which you get from different spectroscopy techniques. NMR is perhaps after I say, which is not a spectroscopy technique per se, is a different concept. But among the normal spectroscopy techniques, the information content of NMR is the maximum one. You get the maximum information out of NMR experiment as compared to other information. Because this gives you a whole picture of the electronics of, uh, of, uh, of a molecule. And electronics, as we all understand, the basic architect of a molecule is basically uh, the electronic environment, which tells you about the types of atoms, numbers, and, and uh, activity. So, uh, comparison among the different spectroscopic techniques, take C13 and proton NMR as a, as a different domain of NMR spectroscopy. The information content is, is very good, actually. The information content is very good at infection. For whole uh, very expensive and whole range of different problems associated with mass. NMR is not uh, free of problems also for the information content which you get from animal spectroscopy uh, complement and is much larger as compared to other techniques. Uh, no other technique is more descriptive in terms of name, nomenclature than animal spectroscopy. The name, the names, uh, the name tells you everything. Animal
of our study of the nucleus pain magnetic under the influence of applied magnetic field resonance when a nucleus pain placed under the influence of magnetic field it resonates uh, in the presence of radio frequency and you record the whole thing. So if you understand the name, you understand the technique. 50% of understanding of NMR spectroscopy is just understanding the name. And this is perhaps the most uh, sounding acronym of any technique. It tells you a lot about the technique itself. This was the first NMR spectrum, 1951, Oxford, uh, uh, Stanford, ethanol. And again, uh, if I repeat, uh, which I uh, presented earlier, this was an exciting time for chemists. For physicists, I'm not very happy. Physicists, the people who always develop spectroscopy technique, they're the first who develop spectroscopy techniques. And then, generally somewhere in between, disappoint and start doing something else. Chemists take it up. Chemists, uh, after uh, seeing this microscopic, uh, this spectrum, were very excited because they could understand that ethanol in fact has, based on the nature, in fact has three different types of hydrogens, protons. And you see three different peaks. Physicists were di disappointed. Physicists were looking for a technique Physicists were looking for a technique which gives them a quantitative measurement of all the protons or animal nu active nuclei present in the molecule. For them, it was an unwelcome complication. Uh, they didn't really like it. But uh, this potential really tells you a lot about the development which eventually took place in the future. So if you look into the chronology of development, uh, it started from Pelfit and Motor, but 1951, when the chemical shift and spin couplings, uh, based on that ethanol uh, spectrum, people start understanding the chemical shift and the spin coupling. In 1960s, uh, a very important development of signal averaging for improving sensitivity. When people start talking about signal to noise ratio, people start uh, using uh, techniques in which different spectrum were used to be recorded and based on, on the simple fact that noise are random and signals are overlapping, one can enhance the signal to noise ratio. And then the advent of, uh, of, of mathematical procedure of pulse Fourier transmission technique, which has actually changed the whole face of animal spectroscopy because people have realized that they don't really need to record frequency domain, uh, spectrum and frequency domain. They can go for a time relaxation measurement and then by using this this mathematical procedure convert these time domain signal into frequency domain signals. 1970s, when people start developing superconducting magnet, Ellen yesterday uh, summarized uh, very uh, interesting developments in terms of superconducting magnets. This was uh, a time when people start talking about high resolution, large NMR spectrum meters which can go out of domain of a permanent magnet of iron magnet, you know. So people start talking about superconducting magnet. And let me tell you what superconducting magnet is. These are very, very sophisticated, very interesting alloys of some very uh, uh, rare uh, metals like nubium or, or, or different types of metals. And when you place them uh, to, a, to a absolute helium temperature, liquid helium temperature, which is, which is minus 270 Kelvin, and you charge them with electricity, you discontinue charging, and this, they become a superconducting magnet because at that particular temperature, the resistance is minimal. And therefore, they allow you to go a very high field measurement uh, at a very low cost because no other permanent magnet can allow you to go to that level. So this was the important development. Uh, in 1980s, development of multipulse and two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably show you one or few, uh, 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 one or two of pulse sequences. NMR has its own language. Now people talk about not irradiating the molecule at one, once, but they are talking about multiple of pulse sequences, a whole cascade of pulses, which bring uh, in a very predictable, predictable way, way. NMR is very predictable now because you, when you have a nuclear spin. You know precisely of what type of pulse shape, strength, and duration will bring this nuclear spin to what, what state. So it's a very predictable domain 
in which you can predict your nuclear spin uh, at, at a different level by using a cascade of pulse frequencies. And then in 1990s, uh, no, 1980s also, when Genus first presented the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, COSI, so-called two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy, and in a conference, uh, the two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy become almost practically possible after 10 years. He presented in 1971, precisely. Uh, in 1990, routine application of uh, pulse field gradient. But let me talk about two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy. You see, in a very layman language, uh, if you have a very complicated NMR spectrum uh, of a molecule like bravitoxin, you literally have absolutely no idea what you can see. Because uh, in proton, you have an inherent problem of seeing everything in a scale of 0 to 10, or perhaps 12. Uh, and in this very small scale, if you have 200 different uh, atoms, 200 or 300 different hydrogens, you see literally nothing out of it. If you can somehow add another dimension and you start looking from the other side, then you would be able to get more information out of, uh, of the whole experiment. So remember, everything which is possible uh, by 2D NMR spectroscopy, which you get to out of 2D NMR spectroscopy, is possible to be obtained from 1D NMR spectroscopy. The only difficulty is that interpretation is very difficult. So uh, uh, this was mainly started with the with, with the aid, with, with the help for uh, for the help of aid and interpretation. So 1990, uh, this pulse field gradient started. Uh, yesterday it was very nicely presented. Uh, signal selection development of coupled analytical methods. Uh, this has also been demonstrated yesterday. This uh, breakthrough development of coupling a chromatographic instrument with NMR spectrometer was a turning point in the usefulness of uh, NMR spectroscopy. Uh, the beauty of this technique is, as you understand, chromatography is a very, very different type of technique. NMR spectroscopy is a very, very different type of technique. And it literally took people, the dream was always there, you know, back in 1970s, uh, people were talking about couple techniques. When people developed GCMS, uh, LCMS was even, you know, the concept of having LCMS was even earlier developed than DCMS. But there was an interface using this chromatographic technique, which is extremely rapid, which generates a tremendous volume of solvent. And using NMR spectroscopy, which is inherently slow, which takes time, the so-called coupling of uh, so-called marriage of two different domains, uh, two different personalities, was the most difficult one, because the interface, which needs to be developed, required a lot of science. And still I feel that uh, it has not to a level. It is still LC and NMR, and there are some intervention in which you really put something by using uh, the real LC NMR is yet to be developed. Maybe in 10 years' time, people would have LC NMR. But so far, it's mainly LC and NMR and something in between. So this was a development which still requires a lot of uh, further progress. 2000 onward, use of high sensitivity superconducting probes. Uh, yesterday, people talked about prime probes of different nature. People uh, talk about different types of uh, uh, and sizes of uh, uh, NMR probe. And 2000 onward, you were really looking for flow injection NMR, which would be uh, literally a real LC NMR. You would really be looking for the demise and death of NMR tube, tubeless NMR. You are looking for a batch of NMR. I don't know when these dreams will realize, but these are actually going on. Now, let me tell you something very interesting. Uh, started by physicists, taken by chemists. Now, in next 10 years' time, NMR will be largely used by biologists. Most of the most recent developments are in the field of biological applications of NMR spectroscopy. Uh, why bother learning NMR? You see, you have two ways of doing it, actually. You can hire a good person, a chemist who understands NMR spectroscopy, who can interpret results for you, and you just submit your sample to Safras. Safras uh, run this NMR and give, to, give it to somebody else, like most of the companies are doing it. 
You see, you go to Abbott, you go to Eli Lilly, you go to Bristol Myers, you go to large companies, they have absolutely no idea what anima is. They synthesize compound, they isolate compound, they give it to anima section, and there are whole teams of sometimes 100 people doing interpretation for them and doing structure elucidation for them. But uh, being anima, uh, being a natural chemistry chemist, when everything is already automized, when you have a plant extract, you carry out HPLC and you isolate a compound and you give it to somebody else for structural oxidation. What is your use? Absolutely no use, no excitement, no science in it actually. So uh, the whole domain, so first thing is for uh, the basic thrill and excitement of knowing a structure of an unknown compound is a basic driving force of learning animal spectroscopy without understanding at least the basic concepts of animal spectroscopy is very, very difficult to effectively utilize the, the recent development. First thing, the thrill and excitement of knowing the structure, but it offers a lot. The structure sedation, synthetic organic chemistry, and electrical tool for synthetic chemists, for natural product chemists. If you, are, if you are a physical chemist, and if you are actually working in the field of understanding the dynamics, or, if, or even if you are a, a, chem, a biochemist who are trying to understand the interaction of a small molecule with a very large molecule, like an inhibitor with an, with an enzyme, these are all dynamic processes. They are changing with time. And therefore, reaction dynamics, the study of equilibrium, the interaction between, between ligand and, uh, and, and, and substrate, a whole range of different paradigms. And this all uh, can be uh, learned from animal spectroscopy. Uh, being trained as a structural organic chemist uh, who uh, try to understand and appreciate different types of spectroscopy and crystallographic technique, I still feel the X-ray crystallography has a lot of limitations. Although it gives you a complete picture of the molecule, but unless people develop a solution to X-ray crystallography, NMR would still be the stronger technique and better technique than X-ray crystallography. Uh, Structure, the information, you get a three-dimensional structure of proteins, DNA, complexes, polysaccharide. In drug designing, the structure activity relationship NMR spectroscopy, so-called SER by NMR. This is a very interesting uh, technique, SER by NMR, SAR by NMR. You know, uh, in Abbott, you will find a lot of people talking about structure. It was all, all started in Abbott, Chicago. Structure activity relationship by unique using animal spectroscopy. Uh, I have, I don't claim to be understanding the whole concept, but what I understand is something very interesting. You see, you have a large molecule like an enzyme, uh, alpha glucosidase or acetylcholine astrase or whatever. In this very large uh, molecule, biomolecule, that <coughs> enzyme. Requ require certain prerequisites, uh, structural features in the inhibitor. For instance, your inhibitor should interact with the active site or parental site, whatever. And in order to, uh, to have this interaction, it should have certain structural feature. For instance, if your enzyme has minus charge, your inhibitor should have a positive charge somewhere. If your enzyme has, uh, for instance, a carboxylate or something like this, you should have you know, the whole paradigm of, uh, of molecular recognition interaction, whether whether uh, about wall interaction, whether uh, zeotronic interaction, whether charge species, whether general uh, affinity, hydrophobic, hydrophilic interaction, there need to be a structural complementarity, uh, so-called key and lock, lock model. Your key should have uh, compatibility with the lock. Now, in order to discover the structural features which requires to be built in into the inhibitor in order to have its maximum interaction with the larger molecule enzyme, there are a lot of very innovative ideas were developed. And uh, SAR by NMR was perhaps the most revolutionary one. Although I know nothing has developed from that technique so far, but that promises a lot. Now, what you need to do? You take your last molecule, you take smaller molecules of different functionalities, literally only one functionality. For instance, you take small, uh, let's say, ammonium salt, you take a small carboxylic group, uh, not functional groups as well. You can't have a functional group alone. 
They're small molecules with different functional groups. They're small little molecules. And you mix uh, your, uh, these smaller molecules with larger protein, uh, protein or that uh, enzyme. And then you develop, you start understanding the interaction. You see, uh, there are a variety of different ways in NMR spectroscopy in which you can see the interaction by negative NOE, by, by erosion, a whole range of different uh, changes which you see in the molecule, uh, in, the, uh, in the structure of large molecule conformation and configuration changes. Now, if you observe that out of these very small molecules, several which you have added into your enzyme, are some of them have, are interacting. For instance, out of 10 different small molecules, fun functionality, ketone, acids, uh, positive charge, uh, charge, aromatic, a whole range of different things, you find that your amide is interacting, uh, amino, amino charge is interacting. If you find that one of the aromatic grain, uh, compound which we have added with the aromatic ring is also interacting with the enzyme structure that group provides you a very important information. What provi uh, this information provides you that you now you have to develop a molecule which contain all these functionalities in the, in the right direction, in the right distance. So these small molecules which are interacting with the with the enzyme or not doing anything with the enzyme because for enzyme inhibition you need to have a whole uh, structure which fits very nicely in the active site. But these smaller little molecules then need to be built in by synthetic chemistry into a molecule which is compatible with the, uh, with the structure, with the active site of the enzyme. So this was an exciting development and now more than ever NMR is now used for medical diagnosis. Uh, I was fortunate to visit Bezenborg, Rolls-Royce, and different uh, and, uh, broker establishment. Amazed to see that most of the developments are actually going in wide bore probe, in which you can put, uh, put uh, you can put human being into an NMR machine already MRI. But now they're developing wide bore probes in which you can put your rats and your uh, rabbits. I don't know how for insects or whatever, and then. Uh, so called, so called biopsy uh, analysis, so called metabolite analysis, so called tissues and biopsies, a whole range of different development which is currently going on in the field of the biological application of animal spectroscopy. So, this is the future. Uh, now, NMR and natural product chemistry. Why NMR is important for natural product chemistry? Natural product chemists are still the largest user group of animal spectroscopy, and I claim this. Still, I still love most of the animal machines are actually sold to people working in the field of natural product or natural product uh, related sciences. Natural products are generally small in quantities, very small in quantities, sometimes bulk supply. You work on a rare sample of a plant, you isolate few milligrams, perhaps one or two milligrams, and that's it. Nobody will ever isolate that compound. Nobody has ever isolated that compound earlier. So, uh, uh, generally small in quantity, so you need to have a technique which is very sensitive. Unfortunately, NMR is not, and therefore you need to develop a lot of uh, NMR tools. Natural products are novel in the structure. In synthetic chemistry, you always know the structure. You know the structure, you put certain reagent, you know what type of changes will eventually occur. 90-95% time, you have, the, the predictions are true, and you see reduction of a carbonyl group, or oxidation of a carbonyl group, or breaking of a bond, or, or reduction of a bond. Predictable. NMR, uh, natural product chemist, uh, they have absolutely no idea what they are dealing with unless they develop some interaction and they are working on particular types of uh, chemotaxonomic group of uh, plants. The novel structure, generally natural products possess chirality. They are globular. Synthetic chemists are flat. The synthetic uh, molecules are generally flat. If you look into the synthetic, except in cases where people have synthesized the natural product, generally the small racemic uh, Asymmetric organic synthesis generate flat molecule, flat molecule, <coughs> right? So if you look into the over, overall development of new chemicals, so-called pharmacophore or so-called small molecule, these are small flat molecules. Natural products are globular; they have a third dimension. 
uh, invariably. Uh, you isolate a triterpene, you isolate a, 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 a indole alkaline, you isolate rabidoxin, you isolate a whole range of different compounds. They are globular and they have a third dimension. And since they have a third dimension, you need to have a stereochemical interaction. When you have a third dimension, you need to know the stereochemistry. So they possess chirality. The reason why they are able to interact, why natural products are able to interact with biological system, because biological system is also globular. Biological system also has a third dimension. There is no single biological molecule in the body which, uh, uh, which is flat. Even a small little amino acid has a third dimension, right? Except in organic salt, all the biochemistry of, of, uh, of a living system is globular. It has a third dimension. So it's, since it has a third dimension, uh, your natural product is compatible with that. Your natural product has more possibility of interacting with the biological system than a small racemic molecule which, uh, uh, which is synthesized by uh, synthetic chemistry. So it, they possess a globularity. Uh, they, they possess chirality and they have a changing conformation for that and they have an interaction uh, and by virtue of uh, use, uh, by virtue of these features they have uh, capacity to interact with a large biomolecule. Now tell me one technique which can uh, provide you confirmation analysis. Very X-ray is a solid state confirmation. You freeze your molecule. Uh, you have everything frozen in time. It doesn't really give you how a molecule is going to behave in a solution conformation. So NMR is one technique which is actually more compatible with the globularity and with the, uh, with the chirality of a molecule in three dimensions and how it behaves in solution. So-called dynamic changes which are actually occurring in the molecule can only be uh, seen by using NMR spectroscopy. Then the so-called development of, uh, of hyphenated technique. No other group in the world have benefited more with the development of hyphenated technique than natural product chemists. You take a chromatographic method, uh, you isolate compound, you take it to NMR, mass, IR, ICP, the whole range of different molecules. And now there are a range of uh, online surveys available by which you can, uh, uh, by which you can see uh, whether your compound which you are isolating is novel, new, known, or whatever. And a part of it goes into 96 value plate and you get uh, the biological screening also. So in one go, online survey, by using uh, chromatographic method, NMR, and only yesterday I was reading that even the proton NMR spectrums are actually available for probability matching, matching uh, by ACD. It was only C13 predict predictions of here, but now 34,000 uh, proton NMR spectrum is available by ACD, by, by which you can compare the NMR of a compound coming out of a chromatographic uh, machine, uh, like LC, uh, and you know precisely the, the, stru the, the structure where there's no so-called deal application, and then you take the biological activity also. So the development of LC NMR was a major uh, breakthrough uh, in the field of uh, natural product structuralization. These are the machines uh, which are actually used. Uh, we have ordered 600 ultra shielded with LC uh, system, so we would soon have this facility available. Now, in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, this is a terrible slide, and I don't think you'll be able to read it, but let me read it for you. Uh, to be an effective user of spectroscopic techniques, you need to, have to develop a sense and understanding of a real chemist. I remember Professor uh, Salimazwa Siddiqui used to say that the structure elucidation, the structure uh, elucidation starts when you touch a plant. And it's such a beautiful saying, you know. Uh, you uh, go to a plant and you are intending to work on that particular plant. Right at, at, at your touch, 
you test and spare, you start understanding these structures. We all understand that uh, the aroma which is coming out of plant is because of small terpenes, right? We all understand that bitter tasting plants generally contain alkalides. We all understand that when you take a leaf and rub it like this, break it and rub it, and if you see some foam coming out, it's because of saponins. You know, uh, when uh, you take a plant, you rub it on your fingers, and you find that uh, you have some kind of irritations or, or, or some kind of uh, binding. It's because of lignans and all that. So, structural sedation requires a holistic approach of understanding the nature, per se. Preparation of sample is very important. You always start with a pure sample, although uh, my friend uh, would eventually talk about dosi also. But uh, uh, LMR spectroscopy or any uh, spectroscopic technique is still dependent on the purity of sample. Uh, I'll just pass on maybe next and next. Yeah, next. Now, what are the typical protocol? As a natural product chemist, how you want to start with? Remember, LMR is a, is a non-destructive technique. So, uh, to all practical purposes, if you are a, uh, if you are a careful chemist, you would not really lose your sample, unless your solvent is nasty and it does some chemistry with your molecule. Uh, LMR is safe and sound, and you recover 100% of your sample without any loss if you uh, are careful. You go for one-dimensional proton NMR spectrum. It provides you information about the chemical shift, coupling constant, integrals. Chemical shift is the environment of protons. Environment, where they are actually located. Whether they are methyl, methoxy, or N-methyl, whether they are just cautery methyls, whether they are, are aldehydic proton, or a carboxylic proton, or a phenolic proton. Environment. Coupling constant tells you about the neighborhood. Which neighbor is doing what effect on your particular uh, nuclei. Integrals tells you the number of protons present. So it provides you a, a, a lot of very important information. To all practical purposes, if you have a small molecule, your uh, interaction with the NMR spectroscopy finished at this stage. You don't really need to go through all this. And this is again, I would really like to emphasize that sometimes not sometimes, but most of the time, we uh, have a tendency of overdoing it. Even if you, we know the structure, we still go for HMBC, Toxy, and I don't know what not. You have to just remember that if you know the structure, and if we have a sim uh, simple molecule, we just have to rely on the data information which you receive from one the elements with ACP. But if you really need to know more about the structure, then you go for COSY first. Proton-proton interaction. Uh, which proton is interacting with which proton? For related spectroscopy. Uh, now, if you're not very satisfied, you go for C13 NMR spectroscopy. Remember, C13 NMR spectroscopy, even with the advent of inverse probe and whole range of, is still very, is still insensitive technique. Then you go for so-called uh, inverse spectroscopy techniques, HMQC. Uh, interaction between proton and proton. So we start from here. Information about proton alone. Cozy interaction uh, information about a more clearly understood information about proton proton interaction. See that in NMR spectroscopy, in, uh, information about the carbons, the types of carbon present, sometimes the multiplicity. HSQC and HSQC, carbon proton interaction. Uh, HMBC long range interaction. NOE, geometrical consideration, so called lapolar coupling, you see chemical analysis. Toxi, total correlation spectroscopy, in which you see the interaction of protons, all the protons present in one spin system. I, there are literally hundreds of uh, uh, NMR techniques, so called software, have, uh, have been developed. Uh, for structural sedation, but these are the most, perhaps the most important one. These are the ones which generally natural chemists use, although you have a range of different uh, types of uh, 
techniques available also. Now, what are the types of NMR spectroscopy? High resolution mode, in homogeneous solution. High power mode, you go for relaxing nuclei, exhibit broad lines, you know, so called high resolution, uh, magic angle spinning. The study of solid, you go for magic angle spinning uh, techniques. Uh, 3D imaging, uh, magnetic resonance imaging resolution. These are uh, four broader categories of NMR spectroscopy available. And within them, there are a number of other. And what NMR can measure? Functional group analysis. So literally, you don't need to have IR. Now, I, I don't want to be a person who is so cynical about other techniques also. Anima, uh, structural sedation, as uh, Dr. Asper said yesterday, is a technique. It is a process in which you need to have uh, information from different complementary techniques. There is always good to reconfirm. Reconfirm from one and other technique. Functional group analysis, chemical shifts, bonding connectivity and orientation. The coupling provides you bonding connectivity and orientation through space coupling by using overhaul effect, molecular confirmation, a whole range of different biological molecules, enzyme sequence and structure. Uh, So-called tertiary structures of proteins can be determined by animal spectroscopy and chemical dynamics when you are actually looking into this, uh, the changes occurring in the molecule uh, in, in the dimension of time. Uh, NMR machine, as we all understand, is fairly simple. You see, Broca is developing a lot of these new tools, but uh, it's just a magnet and a computer, which uh, a magnet which contains your radio frequency synthesizer, your radio frequency uh, reader, and this this is interface with with a computing system, which then carry out the rest of the manipulation. So it's a fairly simple machine. This is your magnet, and I was fortunate to see the earlier magnet in which you see a, a permanent magnet in which you see uh, in which you place your sample in it. So uh, this is your magnet. Detector and frequency generators are now all built in within to a, in, in a magnetic assembly. Any record, here you can introduce computing power in order to manipulate from the data which you are generating of, out of this whole process. Bruca ultra shielded machine, this we have in our institute, and it's all is related to this tiny little thing, so called nucleus pin. This is your magnetic field. What you have done? You have done a very simple operation. You uh, prepare the sample. It contains different nuclei. <coughs> you place them into a very uh, into a very high power magnetic field. And what had actually happened? The only thing what, which actually happens is that nuclear spin align themselves along the magnetic field or against it. So called principle of Boltzmann distribution axis. Here you have more spins orienting towards the magnetic field than against it. And this axis, the small axis, is so-called Boltzmann distribution axis. And this Boltzmann distribution axis is represented by, uh, uh, by a vector, so-called resulting vector, a bulk magnetization vector. This bulk magnetization vector, which is representing a tiny population of nuclear spin, which are in axis uh, along the magnetic field, you play with this. Your, uh, the entire, uh, entire cascade or entire story, entire uh, uh, the so-called theory of NMR spectroscopy is based on this bulk magnetization vector. You play with it. You uh, play with this bulk magnetization vector. You sometimes bring it here. You sometimes bring it here. You sometimes bring it here. You sometimes bring it, bring it here. You sometimes bring it here. By by what process? You cannot remember these are magnetic vectors and they have certain uh, polar axes. In order to bring them into X Y plane, you need to have a radio frequency pulse, and that radio frequency pulse. Uh, provide a torque, so-called nutrition factor. 
torque which bring it to a Y or X, depending on the orientation of this pulse. Now, I want to tell you something very interesting. Uh, when the NMR spectroscopy started, it was a very conventional technique like IR. When you have uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, introduced into the system, and you see this transition occurring. NMR inherently uh, uh, insensitive. NMR, when you have radio frequency, depending on magnetic field or radio frequency, whatever you can vary, you sweep. You sweep radio frequency pulse, and as soon as a certain nucleus pin absorb, you see an absorption line. So it was literally taking ages to develop one spectrum. Now, with the pulse and mass spectroscopy, is a, is a beautiful concept. Whoever developed it must be a very smart person. The concept is that you have all of your nucleus pin, you use a burst of radio frequency, a whole range of radio frequency, a very strong radio frequency, strong enough to excite all of them together. You give this radio frequency burst to your sample, all the nucleus pin excite. When this nucleus spin excite, you get nothing out of it. The experiment start after that, when they start relaxing. When they start relaxing and they want to achieve the level of equilibrium which exists in a natural magnetic environment, this relaxation is then recorded as, uh, 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 as NMR signal, so-called FID. So, depending on the radio frequency pulse, you can bring this vectorization vector to any place, any place on the XY plane. And when they are excited, they have to relax because they are in abnormal state of energy. They have to they have to release the energy. There are various ways of energy, uh, release, uh, releasing energy. Uh, you can go to one of our book uh, in which uh, Professor Tarman's first book on spin. And that has a very uh, good chapter on relaxation mechanism, a variety of different types of relaxation mechanism. But uh, in nutshell, bottom line, this relaxation is recorded. So NMR spectroscopy is not an absorption spectroscopy anymore. Remember, it's also not an emission spectroscopy anymore also, because you don't record the whole thing. The energy which you have provided doesn't really come out from the sample as, as a whole because it just orient uh, and disperse in a variety of different ways also. You require only uh, a, a portion of energy which is involved in relaxation and is, uh, is, is something different. And this relaxation, this, the energy which is com coming out of the system is then recorded in a time domain so-called frequency uh, free induction decay. This, next. this is the NMR spectrum. Who would like to see this NMR spectrum? Uh, it's probably, I don't know which sample is this, but maybe a sample which contains maybe four, five, six, seven different protons. Not a very complex uh, sample. And uh, these lines are actually representing the energy loss. Uh, when it 100% re relax, which is never, because the infinite time requires, you see a baseline. So this energy is released, and your reductor releases and records this energy, which is coming out of this uh, 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 as a result of relaxation. This is a time domain signal. Remember, uh, this is just a time, so-called relaxation time. Some nuclei take more time to, be, to relax, some nuclei take less time. The, the nuclei which takes less time are already relaxed at this point of time. The nuclei which take more time, so it's just a time axis here energy and time. So called free induction decay, free, free of the influence of any uh, radio frequency. Induction because it is, it, it is inducing a current into amplifier coil of, uh, of detector. Decay because it's decaying actually. You know, it's just decaying and it's going back to the thermal equilibrium. This frequency, uh, free induction decay is then converted into frequency, uh, uh, frequency domain. And for this, you need a mathematical process, a mathematical process which is called Fourier transformation. Now, remember, your computer cannot read lines. Computer can only read numbers. Computer is not capable of reading lines. Compu computer can read only the numbers. So you have to convert the whole thing into numbers. 
and when you convert the whole thing into numbers, so-called analog to digital conversion, then you carry out a, a mathematical process with these numbers, and you get from FID to a, a time domain signal. Next. I don't know where, but uh, your spectrum which you see, the so-called frequency domain spectrum. Now, the purpose of putting this slide here is just to tell you something very simple which has already been mentioned uh, yesterday. NMR is uh, a field which has its own language. Remember, musicians write their uh, uh, course and they use a language of uh, music. The NMR software writers, people who are developing new bus sequences, use this language. This is the language of NMR spectroscopy. And a, a capable of NMR scientists would be able to read and translate the whole thing into an experiment. See, for instance, yes, yesterday, this is a 90x pulse. This slide is a 90x pulse. What it actually means? It actually means that uh, your bulk magnetization vector is rotated to a 90 degree by using a radio frequency pulse, which was which was placed, which was introduced from the x uh, axis, 90 x pulse, right? This is 180 x pulse, 180. It goes to the next uh, side. And these shapes are gradient shapes, a range of different types of uh, uh, pulses. This, the distance between 90 and 180 is the distance between two pulses. Uh, this is your free induction decay. This uh, provides you uh, information about decoupling because have, this is two nuclear experiment. Uh, and the whole range of different, so this, this is a very, uh, as a language, which is not very difficult. I mean, even a, a person who has uh, no understanding of uh, NMR uh, per se in terms of development of NMR pulse sequence can translate some of it. So this, these are the pulse sequences. Remember, all the COC, TOXI, HMBC, HMQC is in this form. So-called uh, so uh, block presentations of uh, vector presentation, you know, block presentation of NMR experiments. And this is the vector presentation of NMR experiment. Uh, remember, the bulk magnetization vector is uh, uh, from Z to XY plane, split it into static and, uh, and uh, mobile. You see two lines, a so whole range of different experiments. Which, uh, so you relax, uh, you introduce a pulse, you acquire the signal, you, try, you carry out FID, and you can then see your frequency domain signal. Next. Now, you, out of the whole exercise, you get a lot of very useful information. For instance, yesterday, that was mentioned, polarization transfer. This is a natural product. And if you carry out, if you want to know how many carbons you have, there are a variety of different ways of doing it. You can go for high resolution mass spectrometry, HR, EI, HR, MS, FAB, high resolution mass, will tell you how many carbons. But they're not going to tell you these carbons are of which type, actually. So-called multiplicity, either they are methods. NMR provides you a very useful information. And first of all, NMR provides you information how many carbons? Simple peaks. How many peaks? You see more peaks? How many carbons? Their dispersion into this scale, chemical shift, provides you information about their environment, whether they are O-methoxy, uh, methoxy, they are N-methyl, they are uh, coffee carbon, they are CH2, whatever, uh, the environment. And this polarization transfer experiment, which is a tool to get sensitivity enhancement also, with spectral editing, you get information about the multiplicity of signals also, which is a methyl, which one is CH2, which one is CH, which one if you carry out editing, which one is uh, pottery carbon. So, uh, multiplicity information, and, and, and then the whole sequence, chronology of uh, development and, and synthetic NMR spectroscopy, 
in which people started from a normal C13 to broadband decoupling and you know whole range of different things. But this polarization transfer experiment, one application in uh, natural product chemistry is to get the multiplicity, the type, the number of different carbons which are present in your in, in your very complex molecule. Two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy, as I said, uh, you know, the difference between one-dimensional NMR spectroscopy and two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy is very simple in a layman language. Although one can translate into uh, evolution time, one can translate into a whole range of different sequences. You see, if you want to know which proton is interacting with which proton, you have several options to use. The first option is double resonance experiment. For instance, if you are a chemist working in early, uh, uh, late 70s, you had only one option of using it. When I went to uh, Pennsylvania State University and when I happened to be interacting with, interacting with Lloyd, Lloyd Jackman, the man was using double resonance experiment and he was a very large steroids. Uh, it's a very, very steroids score. He was uh, assigning the chemical shift of every proton by using so-called spin decoupling, uh, so-called uh, double resonance experiment. For instance, if you have a molecule, and you see this methyl uh, 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 next to uh, CH2, you irradiate this methyl, bring it out of the domain of uh, uh, X-ray plane, bring it to the, to the excited state. Now this CH2 is simplified because it doesn't have any interaction with methyl, right? So it proved that CH2 is next to a CH3 double resonance experiment. Literally, you can get information about the coupling of different protons in one dimension also. But in a molecule in which we have so many protons, for instance, triterpenes or steroids, when you have literally all CH2s coming in one region from 0.5 to 2, this large envelope of signals, uh, it, it double resonance never work. It doesn't really work. For that, you need to go for a correlated spectroscopy. In certain cases, it doesn't work also, but it just provides you a second dimension. For instance, if you have a lot of mountains, and if you're watching mountains from, from one dimension, and you have a series of mountains, one after the other, you see all, that, all of them overlapping. But if you go to a second dimension, if you elevate yourself and you go on, on top of them, fly on, on a helicopter, you would start looking them into uh, in, in, in the right perspective because you would start differentiating between them and you got a second dimension. So in my opinion, although I try to understand the whole cascade uh, and, the, and the concept of two-dimensional MR spectroscopy as a layman uh, learner of MR spectroscopy, this is just adding a dimension to interpret the results. Thanks. Against NMR language in two-dimensional NMR and one-dimensional NMR experiment, you see only one difference. The one di difference is that in these different experiments, remember these are discrete different experiments. And in this experiment and in this experiment, the only difference is between uh, the, the delay between two pulses. And remember when you add a variable, when you add a variable in experiment, you get a second dimension. The basic concept of adding dimension, when you add a variable into experiment, you get one dimension extra. This is what you get out of 2D NMR experiment. You have seen what we, have, uh, what we get out of one dimensional NMR spectrum? Interferogram. In two dimensional NMR spectrum, you get something like this. And then you have to carry out mathematical process, not once, but twice. Two, uh, uh, two, uh, uh, two Fourier transformation and two Fourier transformation. Next, you get something like this. So this is time time. Each line is representing a different experiment, but each line is different from the other because evolution time is different. Two time domain. Then you carry out one mathematical operation and you convert t two into uh, t one into frequency domain. You see distinction in terms of uh, interferogram, and when you carry out one more uh, Fourier transformation, you have frequency, frequency, and you see experiment like this. Now the only thing which you need to do is to plot it and start looking from the up, and you see all these peaks. These are uh, so-called uh, correlated spectroscopy. This is what your two-dimensional 
Elman experiment uh, look like. It has two scales, one resulting from, uh, uh, from FID, the other resulting from the impact of evolution time on FID. Uh, this is the sequences which involve, uh, this is a bigger raw uh, two dimension data of the Edemar. <coughs> the, the work of uh, magnet, radio frequency oscillator, detector, all finishes at this stage, and all this sequence is the work of uh, a mathematical computing process. So it's all computing which convert this data into a two-dimensional NMR spectrum. <laughs> These are different types of NMR, proton NMR, uh, uh, C13 NMR, and this is your two-dimensional NMR spectrum for a very small, a simple molecule. You go on, please. This is heterogeneous resolve. It is in the the heterogeneous resolve in which you see uh, uh, heterogeneous resolve in, in which you see the company constant in terms of uh, carbon scale. Next, this is your correlated spectroscopy. This proton correlate with this. This proton correlate. So uh, th this is your diagonal line, and all of diagonal peaks uh, after symmetrization will tell you about the coupling between different types of protons. This is uh, inadequate, so-called incredible natural double quantum transfer experiment, in, in which you see coupling between carbon and carbon. So the whole architect of organic molecule can be developed by using inadequate. The problem is that this inherently a very insensitive technique because you are literally working on carbon-13 next to carbon-13, which has possibility of 0.001%. This is uh, inadequate of a small molecule. Now, just just for the sake of interpretation, uh, which one is perhaps the most downfield signal? This one. This is interacting with this. And this carbon is next to another CH2, and this CH2 is next to this petrol. The whole framework of a smaller molecule can be uh, uh, seen in the whole uh, inadequate experiment, but larger molecules can also be. This is for a relatively more complex molecule. Next. 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 Uh, for instance, this molecule, which was isolated by Sharma, uh, you see there are three discrete uh, moieties in this molecule. Flavonoid, glycoside, you see this uh, flavonoid, you see sugar, sugar A and sugar B. Now, if, although it's not a very complex uh, molecule, but uh, in this case, uh, most of these protons in sugar are overlapping. This is fine because uh, this uh, different types of protons and you can interpret them largely. But these two, and in cases, for instance, uh, uh, Dr. Bakar, our uh, group is actually isolating saponines with several uh, sugars. Now, the chemist has very apparent option I, uh, to hydrolyze them and then uh, then identify these sugars also. But TOPSI provides you flexibility of recording proton NMR spectrum without hydrolyzing and chopping them up. Next. So for instance, in this case, you see the proton NMR spectrum of this sugar. Next. Again, the same slide, uh, of different types of, so uh, as many, depending on the spin system, you can record separate pro proton NMR spectrum of, uh, of uh, every spin system. Now, in my opinion, this is perhaps one of the most important development in NMR spectroscopy. The development of TOPSI has really changed the whole uh, shape of, uh, uh, of interpretation of NMR spectroscopy. I would not really show much of the spectrum because most of you are aware of it. Uh, the only purpose was just to tell you that animal spectroscopy is and will remain be an important tool for natural product scientists, although it has now a lot of new dimensions, especially going into the biological uh, investigation, going into biotechnology, so-called biochemistry, nuclear science, surface science, and a whole range of different applications. Thank you very much.